Welcome to the channel. I'm your host for today, Claire Headley, and this is my next episode of Scientology Stories, in which I interview people about their experiences in Scientology, as well as how they got out of Scientology. No matter how you first heard of Scientology, we hope you will learn from these stories and that we can educate you in the language and abusive practices of Scientology along the way. And here's my important note. Whether you are currently in Scientology, a former Scientologist, or just curious about it, the bottom line is Scientology does not want you to hear these stories. So thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. Thank you for sharing. And thank you for helping us to educate people on the true nature of Scientology. And my guest for today is Mr. John Atek, um, expert on, on Scientology, a prolific author, and all around just an absolutely amazing person. Please help me welcome him. Welcome, John. Thank you so much for being here today. As Thank we you. were, yes, yes, as, as we were just talking, uh, it's just shocking to me that this is actually our first ever face to face. It's ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> what have we been doing all these years, wasting our lives? Oh. Yes, and you're somebody that I've known of since I was a very young uh, mm. child, actually. So mm. um, I can't wait for this conversation. I think it's going to be fascinating. Um, so, where would you like to start? Whoa. Um, well, let's start with um, something about, about your your past and your background, because um, you were just telling me that, that you were born in England, in Manchester, yes. Yes. And, and grew up in East Grinstead. What, what, years were you, what years were you in East Grinstead from? Yes. Um, so my mother joined the Sea Organization, committing to a billion years of service to Scientology management, of course, when I was four mm. years old. She was a single mom. I had already <clears throat> lost my dad by that point because he had exited Scientology. And so my first experience with disconnection was at age three. Um, I've never known my father oh, as a result terrible. of that. Yeah. How terrible. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we arrived in East Grinstead. I was four, which was 1979. And um, we had spent a couple of years close to Brighton in Rottingdean, as we were talking about. Yep. <laughs> um, that's where I first went to primary school. But for the most part, 1979 until 1988, the majority of that time, I was in East Grinstead at St. Hill in varying capacities. We could have met then. I, I moved back there in 1981 and I didn't leave until 1994. What was your mom's um, maiden name or, or the name you grew up with? Yep, O'Sullivan. Frank O'Sullivan is my uncle. Uh, he's he was He's still there to this day. I remember um, Frank, yeah. Yes, yep. Um, yeah, and so Amber... O'Sullivan is Frank's daughter. She's been involved recently for on behalf of Scientology in the Valerie Haney case. Um, okay. She's the, uh, uh, you know, witch hunt piece of arbitration that they've created to try and avoid lawsuits. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But she, but Amber is my cousin. Mm. Um, <clears throat> she was born into the C organization um, as well. Anyway. Yeah, so um, yeah, my my mother ended up leaving the Sea Organization temporarily when I was ten, and then just mm. never went back. She had a she had my sister or my half sister, um, and and I spent uh, two years at Greenfield School, which um, I read about in your book, A Piece of Blue Sky. Um, under the principal Margaret Hodkin, and I should I, I would just like to note that I um, was subject to Scientology interrogation tactics at Greenfields, being mm. made to write up my overts and withholds. And mm -hmm. anyway, just interesting parallels uh, and interesting, you know, correlations. And uh, mm. yeah, but yeah. So in 1988, my uh, we all moved to the U.S. and that was my, the end of my time in England. Um, I, of course, have been back to visit my non-Scientology family since getting the heck out of Scientology. But uh, there you have it. <laughs> and and um, so whereabouts in the States did you move to? And were you by then in the Sea Org? 
So we moved to um, Los Angeles area, mm -hmm. essentially, and my stepdad was the head of the Beverly Hills Mission uh, franchise, you know, getting people into Scientology for mm -hmm. many years. Um, I worked there for a couple of years um, while doing tra Scientology training at Celebrity Center. I was 13 when my family moved to the U.S. and they never they chose never to put me back in school. So I was really just kind of um, doing quote unquote homeschool. It's it's a it's a joke, honestly, to even call it that. I would go study at the library to kind of try and learn American history compared to what I'd been learning <laughs> in in England, and then mainly uh, doing Scientology training. Um, and and then when I was 16 is when I re-entered the C organization uh, in Los Angeles. And then by September of 1991, I move, was moved up to the headquarters in Gilman Hot Springs, California. And, and what post are you holding at Gilman Hot Springs? Uh, for five years, I was in um, the training area in qual qualifications. Mm. Um and then, after, so that was, let's see, 91 until 96. And in March 90, 1996 is when I was moved to Religious Technology Center, which is on the same property. Um, but I spent, I, I spent a year in Clearwater, Florida, training to be a, a representative for Religious Technology Center, um, overseeing the launch of the Golden Age of Tech and, you know, working directly under David Miscavige, mm. for anyone who doesn't know what Religious Technology Center is, it's the highest ecclesiastical organization in Scientology, directly run by David Miscavige, chairman of the board, or rather only member of the board, I should say. <laughs> yes. Chairman of the board creates a false representation that there are others involved, which is not the case. No, tyrant of the board would be... Uh... Yes, more, more accurate, fitting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and of course, religious technology center, as you say, I, I love the use of the word ecclesiastical by Scientology, meaning uh, belonging to a Christian organization. Um, yeah, 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 that's a good point. That's a good from point. From which the word church derives, meaning a Christian congregation or a building in which a Christian congregation worships. Mm -hmm. So some, you know, maybe we have all these problems with Scientology because they have a misunderstood on the word church. Um, <laughs> or and, uh, an intentional misuse of the word, you know, it, there, there's a, which there's is, actually which is a, what it was. Yeah. Yeah. No, there, there were, um, you know, it's the, the, the many, many contradictions that exist within Scientology, obviously, would fill volumes, mm -hmm. but um, to me, there were there were so many writings from Hubbard, and so many of those were not accessible to anybody other than members of the C organization mm -hmm. at high levels. And specifically, the one I that came to mind when you made that comment is an advice or a writing from Hubbard that talks about specifically how. Uh, religion is a control mechanism on the whole track. Th these were his words. Yes. And, you know, and, and, a, and a way and means of controlling people. Mm. Well, he certainly tapped into a system that uh, has destroyed many people's lives. And it's, it's really, it's just evil. Yes, unfortunately so. I mean, if we hunt down the first use of the word church, in Scientology, it was in, um, I think it was the 18th of December, 1953, that in Camden, New Jersey, Ron Hubbard with um, his new bride, Mary Sue, and his oldest son, who was the same age as his new bride, um, L. Ron Hubbard Jr., they uh, registered three churches. Um, one of them was the Church of Scientology. Hubbard would later say the first Church of Scientology was uh, registered by Burton Farber in February 1954 in California. That's not true. Hmm. Um, but Aaron Hubbard was not known for being truthful, let's face it. Right. So he, re he registered this thing and kept it secret, but he also registered the Church of Human Engineering, which we've yet to see, and hmm. um, but it could happen, uh, and the Church of American Science. And in Modern Management Technology Defined, or the admin dictionary as it's usually known, 
there's actually a definition of the Church of American Science. Really? Because, yeah, when John Sanborn was putting these things together, of course, Hubbard had nothing to do. He, he never looked at editions of his books. John, from 1954 to 1978, had complete control to the effect that he could actually rewrite lines. So he wouldn't publish him of Asia when it was written in 1954 because he thought the, the claim, I am Maitreya, was a little too far. Right. There you know, was somebody who understood what Buddhists think. And it took him 20 years, I think it was 1975, he finally published it, having changed the first line to, am I Mateo Maitreya, oh. instead of I am. But so John had, had, you know, significant control of what was said, but we can be sure that Hubbard never bothered to second draft anything because he didn't have the attention span to do that. Yeah. So you know, that, I think that's partly why there are so many contradictions um, which act to paralyze the, the person reading them because you've got two opposing pieces of information. You know, when somebody asks for a refund, always give them a refund. When somebody asks for a refund, never give them the refund. Those yes. are policies issued by, you know, among, as you say, thousands of contradictions. Right. And it, it creates a kind of double bind where you don't know which one to follow. And so you ask your boss what to do. And when Hubbard was alive, he could say what that was. And Miscavige now has, has ruled for even longer than Hubbard did. Um, right. And, and is pretty much driving the whole thing into the ground at the moment, which is good. Yeah. But the Church of American Science, it explains in this definition that it's to recruit Christians, that's the word church, and to move them on, and I quote, to something, some better sort of activity like Scientology. Wow. Holy moly, it's crazy. <laughs> it is. And I mean, that that brings us, you know, I, I some time ago last year recorded an audio book of my little booklet, um, Scientology, The Cult of Greed, which is around here somewhere. Who knows? Um, I'm well, sure I had a copy of it. Um, yes, I'll, I'll link to, to each of your books in the description for this video. How about that? Thank you. <laughs> yes. And it, this, it was written I, I, in 93, I think it was, a, I published a booklet called The Total Freedom Trap, which went into 11 languages, which I was quite pleased about, though only the Dutch sent me any royalties. I'd just like to remind some people. They, <laughs> uh, it, was, it went out in Japanese, which is brilliant. Wow. Um, and Norwegian and, you know. I came back to it to rewrite it in about 2014, thinking, you know, this is a this is a short book booklet to explain Scientology to people who've not had the misfortune of being involved in it. So, you know, minimal Scientology words and straight for the jugular vein. And that became Scientology Cult of Greed, which was first delivered as a lecture in St. Petersburg, of all places. I wouldn't be able to go there anymore, sadly. Lovely place. Wow. Um, very sad what's happened since. Yeah. But it was a way of compacting what I consider to be the most important information. So you've got, you know, a section on the attitude of Hubbard towards Christianity. You know, heaven was a, a fabrication. That was, it was a kind of movie set that was set up to implant people in. Uh, Christ was an implant, whether you accept that was, uh, I think uh, he starts with 600 BC as one of the possibilities, the Nic Nicodemians, he says, did it? Or it could have been 75 million years ago during OT3, you know, take yes. pick. <laughs> but you've got all these confident, you know, there's even a thing called a letter to a Roman Catholic saying, you know, of course you can be a Christian and do Scientology. And you're going, on what planet? Right. You know, yeah. So, you, if, as long as you accept that you're inhabited by a load of body thetans and that Jesus and the cross is a fabrication and that reincarnation is a reality and all sorts of other things. Yeah, or then, even or even fundamentally, what's true for you is what's true, uh, mm. you know, it, which is one of the the quotes that they have, I think, at the beginning of every book by yeah. Hubbard. And so it seems benign to somebody just going, oh, OK, so I can just take take what works and discard mm -hmm. the rest, but nothing could be further from the truth in actuality. No, it, it, the white taped route that has to be followed, you know, the road to truth must be trod with true steps. We were expected to be truthful, not something that Hubbard was very good at. 
Yes. Uh, which coming from a man who said honesty is sanity is a little bit difficult. Um, <laughs> what are we supposed to think? Yeah. But it, I, I wanted to talk about that and I wanted to to get the hard selling out there because that's I, I was really shocked. My uh, first wife took the registrar sales course uh, in the last year that we were involved. And when I saw the material on this course, which we had no idea about, we were public Scientologists. We didn't know that all of our sales conversations, or well, most of them, they were meant to be recorded. Mm -hmm. We didn't know that there was a tag team. There was somebody listening in on a loudspeaker in the next room who was ready to, to come in. And we didn't know about the brick overcoat and, and Les Dane's bizarre ideas about human beings and this Hubbard notion that um, you use hard sell because, let's face it, non-Scientologists are just raw meat, dead in the head wogs anyway. So you can do what you want to them. And it just this psychopathic attitude towards all of humanity. Right. And the elitism, this notion that once you become a Scientologist, as you say, with the billion-year contract, thousand million years, thankfully, not the British billion, which is a million million, which would be right. much, much more arduous. <laughs> Big difference. Thank goodness I didn't sign a contract in England. I mean, Ten I ton. did, but I didn't start it there. So I'll take the American version. <laughs> yeah, I would definitely do that. But you're being told that this is a system that will make you completely self-determined. And then you're signing a, a thing which basically says that you will follow and uphold command intention for a billion years. So you won't ever be self, well, not for not the first thousand million years, you won't ever be self-determined. And we kind of quite glibly went past all of these many contradictions, wanting to believe that Scientology was a, a redeeming force that was going to bring an end to war crime right. and insanity not realizing that it was insanely criminal war machine fundamentally right yeah <laughs> as no, we you... have seen yeah and and not only that but undermining and destroying some of the most basic um human elements mm. like family relationships you know um and even respect empathy um it's it's crazy by the time when, when I started waking up, I had just, it, it struck me that the perfect C organization member would be an Android devoid of all emotion and just like programmed to carry out unquestioningly, um, absolutely destructive orders. Mm. And, you know, I'm like, uh, yeah, I know it, I've, I recently um, had kind of been talking about my time in Religious Technology Center, partially because of my testimony last year at the during the Danny Masterson trial. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but it brought back a lot of, obviously, traumatic memories. But yes. what, one of them was that Hubbard's description of the, the what he wanted members of Religious Technology Center to emulate the exact quote was hard as cold chrome steel and somebody a, a viewer commented that with one word exception that's a direct quote from an adolf hitler speech mm -hmm. to nazi youth cold as uh, hard as cold krupp steel is the is the adolf hitler quote hard as cold chrome steel is the hubbard quote it's insane just craziness yeah and and the more we look at the context of Scientology, where did it come from? What was it about that um, there are a set of really, I, I, I think of things, I mean, Hubbard had this thing about something being pro-survival or contra-survival. Yeah. Uh, you know, who's to estimate which is what and for whose survival? That's a little bit too complicated for me. But I can see something that is pro-social or anti-social. And then you have asocial, something that's, you know, where people are just not concerned. And Scientology is fundamentally antisocial. It, yep. it, as you say, it breaks down all relationships. Your, your key relationship must be to whoever's in charge of Scientology. That person, you know, demands obeisance and obedience. And seeing the way, as you say, that families are, are broken up, uh, any competing group will be broken up. Critics will be ruined where possible. You know, I had um, 
16 years of, of head-on harassment from 1983 when I, I left in the October of 83. And for the 12 years that I was active, and then for four years beyond, because in January 1996, I just went, I, I can't take this thing on anymore by myself you know yeah. it's me versus i don't know about forty thousand people with two or three billion dollars this is silly right um thankfully by that time i think we'd managed to put most of the really significant material in the public record because the internet had come along in the early 90s and so um you know, I amassed this enormous collection. It's about 60 bankers' boxes of material. Um, Gordon J. Melton, who who wrote a horrid little book saying how wonderful Scientology is, which is pretty much a, a restatement of their own PR manual. When I approached him and said, oh, could we talk about what you've written, you know, and the, the documents it came from, because he's in fact wrong on every point. And he said no, that um, he had intended when he retired to write another book about Scientology. But unfortunately, Janet Reitman hadn't returned his box of materials. And so I said, Gordon, you can have my 60 boxes of materials if you want. <laughs> and he declined and said he was now studying vampires instead, which is probably a better use of his time than promoting <laughs> Scientology. It is definitely a better use of his time than promoting wow. Scientology. But Wow, that's crazy. Absolutely crazy. But, it, you know, what was essential in that material? So, for example, you know, I think anybody who seriously believes that Scientology is a good thing should read the Branch One training, which is about eight 800 pages, the um, investigation full hat, as it's called. Yes. And most of it derives directly from lectures and articles written by Hubbard. Uh, so there's no question about who was running it. Um, it has training routine lying in it, of course, which is, uh, you know, honesty is sanity yet again. Here we go. Yeah. But it also has, you know, the L. Ron Hubbard's conference with the investigators and these in incredible things that these people are reading um, Black Boomerang or um, The Spy and His Masters by Christopher Felix or Sun Tzu's Art of War or Clausewitz on War. And th this is some kind of religious training. To, to make these kind of ninja terrorists of, of the Guardian's office. It's fascinating. Right, which, which clearly outlines the body of knowledge that fair game is a part of. You yeah. know, Sci Scientology loves to say, oh, well, there's this one piece of paper where we claim whatever. It's just nonsense. They, well, the, the yeah. cancellation of fair game says that the words fair game will not appear in any order because it causes bad public relations. It doesn't say that the practice of fair game is cancelled. Right. Just that the words will not appear on any order. That's right. And it's a body of knowledge and a, mm. absolutely, as you say, a practice within Scientology that is extensively covered by Hubbard mm. many, many times, mm. including destruction of anyone who dares say anything negative about Scientology, muzzle them, silence them, destroy them. <clears throat> Ruin them utterly. Yeah, ruin them utterly. Exactly. Yeah. And they can be lied to, they can be tricked, cheated, sued, anything you like, because they are no longer human beings, because they have opposed the will of the founder. Um, this, this crazy thing. I, my, you know, it, I don't essentially work on Scientology per se anymore. I end up talking about it because that's what I'm known for. And, but I use it to exemplify authoritarianism in its many forms the idea of a society where you have a, a know-it-all bully who decides what we do and everybody going oh well, i think we should do what we're told you know which yeah. is not my idea of the perfect society i i happen to believe that democracy although it is a dreadful system as winston churchill said is the best system and we could make it a lot better i think if we particularly dealt with the plutocracy that's going on around the, the western world at the moment and if if power was in the hands of of more people yeah. that would be a good thing but it my my interest in in science you know, I'm, I'm largely interested in prevention now in showing people what authoritarianism is and in uh, my book opening our minds it, scientology is just the most convenient example for just about every kind of nastiness there is and the 
fascinating thought is that two people such as you and I, who I think we're probably both good hearted people who mean well in the world. And I don't think, you know, I think you were born that way. And I think I was born that way. Mm -hmm. That's my temperament. And yet we found ourselves drawn into this system, you with without any real choice, because it came through your mother and through your family. Um, I was recruited. Um, but, uh, you know, I, nonetheless, we both believed that we were doing good in the world. Right. That shock when you, it suddenly dawns on that you've actually been an instrument for harm. You've been used as a weapon by a tyrannical egomaniac who was also a malignant narcissist with bipolar disorder and probably temporal lobe epilepsy as well. This sick man who, who, only wanted all he wanted was adulation from people as malignant narcissists always do because he had no self yeah. because he didn't know how to love because he didn't know how to um have affection for any anybody or anything in the world the way he reacted when he heard of quentin's death his oldest son by mary sue who was 22 when he committed suicide that mary sue hubbard quite rightly keened you know cried and wept and you know couldn't deal with the fact that her son was dead. Right. Ron Hubbard said, pretty much, this is another fine mess you've gotten me into. This will cause bad public relations. How could you do this? That contempt for his own child. Right. And that, in fact, of course, the focus of the most harassment from Scientology ever was his oldest son, L. Ron Hubbard Jr., who had his little ways and <laughs> You know, it was but he was very honest about it. He said, "I'm a chip off the old block. You've got to watch me." But nonetheless, the, the harassment—you know, harassing your own kids for decades—you know, yeah. there's something wrong with a religion that's founded by such a person. Did, what happened? What happened to you? Was there a moment of realization for you? Well, <laughs> great question. I mean, really, when when you boil it down, the because of because I was four, really, I, I mean, my my mother was a Scientologist when I when I was born, mm. but she joined the Sea Organization when I was four. So mm. I had never allowed myself to even conceive of a life outside of Scientology, yeah. honestly, <clears throat> because it came with such um, daunting losses. Like to you know, mm. I I knew I would never see my my family ever again, you know, I was very close to my half siblings, I raised them. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, the the control and leverage that Scientology had over me made it such that I literally never even allowed myself to think that thought. Mm. What about how could I get out of here? I, I had already been completely miserable for many years working in religious technology center. Finally, in September 2004, I was put in the hole because I refused to divorce uh, my husband, Mark, <laughs> by David and, Miscavige, and head on. Unless there's, unless there's somebody here who doesn't know what the hole is, so pretty tell us about yes. the hole. Yeah, so the things had been getting worse and worse and worse in terms of conditions at that headquarter property in Gilman Hot Springs. Mm -hmm. And starting in, I would say, beginning of 2004, um, David Miscavige started declaring people suppressive people, suppressive persons. And mm. it started with a room in the, so it, it was these double wide trailers at that property, which was originally the Commodore's Messenger Org and Exec Strata. So, you know, whatever, those are meaningless terms for the top management organizations mm. in Scientology, really. Like all the top, you know, the Mark Yeagers of the world, Mark Ingber, Graham Lyman Lesevre. Spurlock, Guillaume yep. Lasserve, yeah, all the, yep. anyone that, you know, other than David Miscavige that you've seen speak at mm. a public event, if for any Scientologist tuning in, all those people worked in that, those double wide trailers. Yep. And when people started being declared like people, meaning, you know, Mark Yeager, uh, being declared a suppressive person, um, though this became the whole. Um, mm. It was renamed as the whole, and it, 
um, management executives were restricted, not allowed to leave there. Uh, there were group seances of confessions. It, it, it got worse and worse, and it got even worse after I left, as is covered in Mike Rinder's book, A Billion yeah. Years. Yep. He says that there, I think there were 140 people packed into these double trailers, and there were no showers. You had to, to go off to shower, and there was something like, what, two toilet cubicles or something? That's right. For 140 people. Right. Um, and that that it, I mean, he talks about it, it getting quite violent in there. Yeah, it was, it was like a kind of Lord of the Flies situation. One hundred percent, absolutely. Okay. And a lot of that. So, like I said, that had started um, mm -hmm. during the time that I was still there. So, September two thousand four is when David Miscavige told me I was a the C ending in T word to my face and kicked me out, put me in the hole. And, um, and, you know, so it's kind of funny, but, um, Shelly Miscavige during the years that I worked very closely with her in religious technology center had told me many times when you're at that level, you have forgone the right to escape, forgone the right to leave. It's not even an option anymore. And I took that somewhat literally because I had seen, um, top executives in religious technology center try to escape like for example sue will gentry escaped all the way to south africa and was aggressively pursued and brought back so you know when you think as i did having been born into it and gr growing up in it that they're not going to let you go um there's power to that it carries yes. great great uh, wait in well, you have what's called learned helplessness by psychologists that the, the point which came from a, a experiment which i by martin seligman which i'm not at all keen on where he was strapping dogs down and giving them shocks you know <laughs> funny things that psychologists can do <sighs> um but one day they forgot to put the harnesses on and the dogs still didn't move when they were shocked and that was the birth of this concept of learned helplessness that that it you know how how do you know, in Southeast Asia, how, how do you train an elephant to do what it's told? You know, how do you train this immense creature to bow down when it's told to bow down, to lift trunks? Well, sadly, you do it with violent means. But, you know, it's not pleasant. But the elephant loses the sense of power. Yes. And and so it is for us as people that, that put in a situation where all around are losing theirs we, you know, give up our, our, the locus of control over ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it was amplified and exacerbated by the physical location of that property, the physical security of it, the, the, yeah. the extreme isolation of it. So, you know, for example, it's not that I had a car that I could get into and drive away, you mm -hmm. know, even, even that level of simplicity that, people might take for granted outside of that environment you know but yeah so <laughs> so so i got put in the hole and i was like well at least i'm not in rtc anymore so i have no longer forgotten my right to try and escape <laughs> you know it's, it's funny how you at least looking back on it in my mind i kind mm. of clung on to these little beacons that, that I could take as hope, even though there was, you know, it was a terrible situation. But the bottom line is, is that the breaking point for me was when Mark escaped and left me behind. Oh. Um, <laughs> because it made, and, you know, in retrospect, I mean, we, we sometimes laugh about it or poke fun mm. at each other about the circumstances around that. But I do, and we talked about this on Leah Remini, Scientology in the Aftermath, and I was mm -hmm. quite honest in that had Mark, had had our paths crossed that day that he was trying to escape, I cannot honestly say I would not have tried to turn him in or mm -hmm. convince him to stay. You know, as much, even at that point, though I knew I was miserable, the it felt terrifying to even consider life outside of Scientology, um, you know, with with no no context, no resources, knowing that I would lose my family, knowing that it would, you know, 
cost me a hundred, at least $150,000 to ever speak to my family again, which is actually the so-called freeloader bill. Right. Exactly. Mm. And those are like, mine was, mine is $96,000. Mark's yes. is $63,000 or something cl close enough, you know? So, mm. so, <laughs> you know, all those things that have complete control over you and thinking that, uh, it just causes this complete apathy about even considering trying to get out of it. You feel like let, you... Let me give you an example of it. Yes. I, I had the great privilege of exit counselling um, the um, the Youngs, um, Stacey and, and who later to be Stacey Minton, Stacey yes. Brooks, uh, and um, Robert Vaughan Young. And they'd been out for four years but they were still in. They were still. They were not talking to anybody who hadn't been in the Sea Organization who was involved with Scientology. They were certainly not talking to anybody who'd left. And Vaughan read what's now "Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky," and um, phoned me up in England. And I was in LA the next week. I, I was booked, so I went down and saw them. And one of the things they told me was that they had both independently decided seven years before they left that they wanted to leave but they didn't dare tell each other. Yes. So for 7 years <laughs> this because they didn't want they didn't want to lose each other. Right. And and so you know this what a horrifying thing that that your own that your freedom of speech has been reduced to nothing. That, yes. that you cannot talk about what you really feel and you're only meant to talk about it when you're in an auditing session. Yes. You know, you know so that you can get into more trouble for for realizing that the world is actually the way it is and for speaking the truth about it, which you're not meant to do. You're meant to be saying, this is absolutely wonderful. I love sleeping two hours a night and and not not having proper food. And it's great. We're, we're the, <laughs> the best religion in the world. Just right. unbelievable. I, I, I did um, work with a, a woman who'd spent uh, 20 years in the Sea Org and, and worked at Gold um, doing book illustrations. And her experience was really quite remarkable. She'd been in a dreadful marriage for about 15 years. And um, every time she complained about her husband hitting her, um, she'd be told that he was Karkan, that no ethics action could be taken against him. So yes. he was a tyrannical psychopath who was abusive and nothing ever happened. Um, and, and, and Karkan, of course, is the... Um, the Hubbard writing, which essentially says that the person, the I mean, the direct quote is, they can get away with murder. Yeah. And, and it, it, it comes from Genghis Khan. Yes. <laughs> so it's exactly. from the, the Golden Horde of the Mongols. And they can, you know, if they want to murder a few thousand Chinese people, they're allowed to do it. Right. You know, as long as their stats are up, you know, yes. as long as they're making money for Hubbard. Yep. So H she'd have Hubbard, this Hubbard and Scientology will give them full protection to do whatever it is they want to do. Yeah. Just unbelievable. And and which of course we we saw with the Danny Masterson case, this notion that because somebody's giving a lot of money to Scientology, they can do no wrong and they right. must be protected um in this despicable way that he was protected. That's right. But this this woman had then met a man. And fallen complete, they fell completely in love with each other. And they'd been together for three years at the Int headquarters. And during that time, they'd had a total of three days together. In three wow. years, they'd had three days off together. And she'd come out to nurse her mother after an operation and got this inkling that maybe <laughs> the Int headquarters was not the perfect place in the world. I was um, brought in. Because they, her mum had found all around the, the various people in the US who might be able to help them, and they'd all said, "Not going to touch this." I was on holiday, and I, you know, I got three days holiday in between meetings, and I gave that three days up wow. to talk with this woman. And um, I did get to see a baseball game, so that was all right. You know, but <laughs> I saw the the Marlins versus the Giants, and it was the Marlins' first ever game. It was, so it was back in '93, but um, the her husband turned up uh, with Ken Hoden in tow, and I had to sit there and keep Ken quiet so that they wouldn't ra do exactly what you're saying, round her up and take her back. Right. And uh, it was a very scary day because Ken Hoden sat there going, I was a jet pilot. 
I, my dad was, we all know that all religions hate all other religions. My dad was a minister. And it was like, I thought, when's he going to hit me? When's he going to hit me? Wow. And we got to it and, you know, woman and her husband went out into the yard and, and talked and said their goodbyes. And the mother made a cup of coffee and it was on the, you know, the, the hot plate, just, just brewed for Ken Howden. And as he was about to leave, the guy he was with said, oh, this, this lady's made you a cup of coffee. And I realized at this moment that he was a lot more frightened of me than I was of him because he took a hot cup of black coffee and poured the whole thing straight down his throat. I'm sure it would take him two or three weeks to recover from the burn he gave himself. Wow. He got to get out of that room be because of my bad OT powers, you know, or, or something. Just unbelievable. But but yes, the hanging on to people and not letting them go. So so how did you affect your escape? Yeah, well, so but but hold on a minute. So what yeah, happened? Yeah, yeah, tell us more. Tell us more. What, yeah, what happened with the with this staff member then? Um, she stayed out. Um, she uh, was counselled by um, the late great Margaret Singer, and um, I never heard from them again, which I fear. So is... she didn't end up going back. Oh no, she didn't end up going back wow. they, over my dead body. That yeah. was not going to happen. Yeah, um, I probably but... knew this person. That's why I was curious. Yes, I'll tell you who it, who it was afterwards. Yeah, no, no I, worries. I don't want Interesting. To. Yeah. I and I, I remember hearing about a couple of similar instances like this, mm. um, and and that's what again why I was asking that. But the the example that I remember was um, an example that taught me learned helplessness because this woman another woman had um there was an attempted deprogramming you know I, I don't think that's really the right word any longer i think i feel that's too harsh i, I um, tend to associate it with ted patrick and kidnapping and and i was have always been absolutely outspoken against kidnapping yes and i've never been involved with it yeah. Um, it's, it, it just seems the wrong approach completely. Yeah. You know? yeah, exactly. Because in this case, um, that woman ended up breaking, getting getting away and going back to the, mm. the base. And then she was for a long time isolated, restricted to that property, doing heavy manual labor, getting interrogated, you know, all these things that were kind of like the 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 programming mm -hmm. things that we knew this this is will happen to you if you try to break free they mm -hmm. will bring you back and you will be reprogrammed as a person until that last little spark of hope of trying to get out has been completely snuffed mm -hmm. out yeah i mean i mean i i so richard reese is 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 the person who comes to mind uh richard was the um technical secretary for the united kingdom so he was the the boss of all auditing i um, i knew i knew richard really well I'll, I'll tell you a few parallels when you're done talking mm, about richard he was uh, so he was considered to be the best auditor in the united kingdom it was what 1982 and i complained that um my ot5 auditor mike austin um couldn't open the window to his auditing room, which was smelt disgusting. Yeah. And and this guy, and I'm kind of going, so he has these OT powers, but he can't get the window open. This is mm -hmm. a little bit worrying for me. <laughs> and I didn't feel I was getting anywhere. And so I got Richard Reese, who was like the best. And in the morning he had Van Morrison up in London. And in the afternoon he had me, uh, poor man. And it really stopped me looking at this man who seemed to have died. He seemed to, to have left his body behind, that he just seemed to be completely wooden. Nothing would change his expression. There were no emotions left. Mm -hmm. And later, I mean, he's the guy, uh, Bill Clinton talked about having been at Oxford with a Scientologist. Well, that was Richard Rees. Really? Uh, yeah, Richard did a master's at Oxford. I did not know that. Yeah. Um, and he... You know, and, and Clinton would say, well, it can't be that bad because I knew one of them. And you're going, yeah, that, that's a really brilliant argument, Bill. <laughs> oh, come on, guy, you know. Um, but it, I talked with somebody about him afterwards who'd known him well and said, oh, he was a wonderful man. He was a lovely man. 
And then he did the rehabilitation project force. Mm. And he just was about not breaking any rules anymore. Yep. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, no, I grew up with, so his children, Richard's children, Becky and Jesse, were in the cadet organization with me. Um, mm. And I went to school with, with both of them. I knew them. Um, Richard Reese was also very good friends with my stepdad, Hugh Witt. Mm. Um, they bo both worked at St. Hill together um, in the advanced org overseeing the upper levels. Mm. <clears throat> and Richard Reese called my father, my stepdad, um, in July 1991 and told my stepdad that if I didn't start the um, EPF, like basically go back into the C organization the next day that Richard was going to get a committee of evidence. And, um, and at 16, to me, this was a huge burden that I, I felt trapped. I felt like mm. I, I can't be responsible for this person who's a really good friend of my stepdad getting, getting overhauled with justice just because I I didn't want to start into the C organization, so I did. <laughs> that was those were my Richard Reese stories. <laughs> I had a friend at fifteen, and you will have known her. At fifteen said that that she was done and she wanted to leave, and could she leave now? And they said, "No, you signed a C organization contract." And they brought out a contract that she'd signed when she was six years old. Yes. And they managed to persuade her that it was valid in some way. Oh, my gosh. And it took her, well, certainly another 15 years, maybe another 20 years to get out. Wow. Um, yeah, the, the first time I signed a contract like that, I would, I think I was seven or eight. Then again, when I was 12, then again, when I was 13, then again, when I was 14. And I did not, but I did not want to join the C organization. I did not hmm. want to be a part of it. The only thing I, re like my core memory is funny as a child growing up in the cadet organization all i wanted was a normal life and i had yeah. kind of created this idea in my mind that that i never told anybody about but i had decided that i wanted to go to oxford university mm -hmm. i wanted to become a teacher and that i would teach in a scientology school i wanted to have two kids and then when i was 45 years old which as a child, to me, that would be when my life was over. Yeah, uh, then I would join the C organization. <laughs> what was that? All right. Well, yeah, when your life was over at 45. The, right. Yeah, the, it's a long way off when you're a kid. I mean, my friend was is a very talented artist and wanted to go to art college. And um, it, it was just not going to happen. Um, yeah, so uh, your escape from uh, Gilman yes. Hot Springs. Tell us about that. That's got to be exciting. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. So, so, and, and it's interesting that we were, because we touched on this, but, but, and Mark and I just talked about this the other day, never once in the 13 years that we were married at that property, because we, we met there and we're married there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> never once did we talk about trying to get out of there yeah. together. Um, because, because we both knew that if we did and if because we would frequently get interrogated and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And if we had one slip up and mentioned anything, then we would be separated. You know, the whole shebang would kick in and they yeah. would. And already from starting in, gosh, 19. So we were married in August 1991 and already starting in December 1991 for some reason. David Miscavige constantly every few years would be like, oh, you're still married to him. Oh, you know, like and then eventually requiring that I divorce him or get kicked out of religious technology center. It was just mm -hmm. constant, constantly tr trying to drive wedges into our relationship. Mm -hmm. But we had never talked about trying to get out, even though we were both independently miserable the closest we'd gotten to that is mark did tell me at one point towards the end that the only reason he was still there was because of me <laughs> yeah and um anyway so 
Uh, yeah, so I was in the hole. Mark was go going to be sent to the rehabilitation project force in Los Angeles the next morning. So for all intents and purposes, he knew that no matter what, he was never going to see me again. Yeah. So his options were to go to the RPF and never see me again or escape and never see me again, you know? <laughs> So, and, and, uh, so he had radioed me, we had these phones, they weren't ours personally, the, the records were monitored just to make mm -hmm. that clear. Mm -hmm. They belonged to Scientology. Um, but they it had this radio feature, like we could just, you know, it was like a, a radio. Mm -hmm. So he had radioed me at like three o'clock in the morning and said, are you going to come home? And I said, well, I'm going to try to at least come home and take a shower, um, but I don't know that at I'm going to three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. 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 I'd been working. I hadn't been home in several days by that point. It had mm. been like the last time I'd seen Mark was towards, it was about a week earlier, mm. even though we worked on the same property, you know, it was just ridiculous. Anyways, I never made it home. And, um, and so he escaped and, and, I was dozing at my desk at around 11:30 that morning. So it was it was January 4th, 2005. Okay. And um I got woken up by Gerald Duncan the ethics officer and was dragged to see Jenny Linson who was the head of the hole at that time. And she told me that Mark was escaping down the highway. Yeah, I was like that moment was just like the my whole world had been pulled out from under me. I was just like, Ugh. it was like a physical gut punch, you know? Yeah, absolutely, um, yeah. And and like my it, it was kind of like um if there's a flood, like your instant reaction is to try and plug the hole, mm -hmm. and my reaction was I'll go get him back right now. This this has got to stop. <laughs> And um, originally they were going to have me go out there and try and get him back. Um, but so I was getting ready to go and retrieve him from Highway 79 where he was, you know, driving off on his motorcycle into the sunset, you know, figuratively. The metaphorical sunset. Yeah, metaphorical, exactly. Um, but then Danny Dunnigan, one of the security guards, came in and said, oh, Mark just called the police. He's gone to the dark side. He's an enemy now. You can't go. Which, you know, now, thanks to Anonymous, we were able to get a copy of the police report. Mm -hmm. Mark didn't call 911. A passerby saw Gold Security run him off the road on his motorcycle and get start an altercation. And call, they called 911. Mm -hmm. And that... Riverside County Sheriff's Office responding to that call is the only reason Mark succeeded in his escape. And frankly, yeah. is the only reason I'm here today. <laughs> because, you know, it started this um, cascade of events that once it started, there was really no stopping it. Because for me, um, I, I, I was devastated and <clears throat> I um, considered my options very carefully. But very quickly, I realized that the only reason I had survived as long as I did in that place was because of Mark. And mm. obviously, he's my husband. I love him. We'd been married 13 years. Now I'm being told he's a suppressive person. And I'm like, that is the biggest bunch of nonsense I've ever heard. Mm. Um, and it just kind of started the, the, you know, the house of cards falling down because if they're mm. if they'll lie about that then what else you know and like who am i kidding myself i'm miserable here uh i have no relationship with my family anyway I, they even at the new year's event the week earlier so i had i had been denied dining privileges so i lost like so much weight i was like 30 pounds less than i am right now skin and bones literally yeah. could not eat and my stepdad said to me at the at the shrine auditorium he said do they feed you and i said yes everything's great you know put on a smiley face you know the good roads fair weather mm -hmm. uh you know let's just pretend everything's wonderful i i i had broken my leg a few years earlier i wasn't even allowed to tell them about that until it was all fixed and like it was a two-year process to recover from wow. that 
uh, cause I almost lost my foot because they didn't call 911. I mean, it just goes on and on like mm -hmm. the level of insanity at that property. And mm -hmm. so when Mark was gone and uh, like, I just recognized this giant void and that he was really the only thing that made it survivable at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And so I had to be start on the very daunting path of figuring out how to get out of there. Um, and so it took me three weeks, um, partially took me so long because Jenny Linson told me David Miscavige had ordered Mark be brought back. Mm. So of course, to me, that meant Mark was going to be brought back. No question about it. Mm. And so in my mind, I'm like, oh, great. So if I escape and I'm like <laughs> riding off into the sunset and he's meanwhile be being brought back, like, End results still going to be the same, you know? Mm. <laughs> oh my goodness. So I had to kind of bide my time and, and I, I went to some pretty great extremes to test that. Like I figured out where he was. I figured out that Mark was with his dad in Kansas city, Missouri. And I called, um, Chelsea Graves, who was, uh, um, a kind of over she was in a religious technology center she had was someone i'd worked with very closely and i said mark is in kansas city i was told that david miscavige ordered that he be brought back so who's going to get him hmm. <laughs> and she was like well i'm gonna have to see and at that moment i was like they're not bringing him back you know hmm. that but i i overtly did that intentionally hmm. to yeah kind of put the squeeze on them to go because at this point I was um you know like I said the house of cards had fallen down and I was playing the game still to avoid detection like I had taken off my wedding rings and just put them on my necklace and was wearing mm -hmm. them under my shirt and you know because I they were demanding that I file divorce papers and you know just move along like let's keep going dust yourself off keep on and write reports and do lower conditions and all the things because obviously i missed all the signs that mark was a very bad person <laughs> obviously yeah anyway just crazy and, and uh, yeah. yeah so so your your actual escape how, how did you manage to get out of the yeah so i figured out a way it was very challenging, but to get a message to Mark, to tell him to call me, um, because at the end of the day, after carefully thinking of all, all my options, and I knew most of the ways that people had escaped from that property. Oh, but by this time, so two days after, or the day after Mark left, I was not even allowed to go home anymore. I was restricted mm -hmm. to, to the hole and was sleeping in a sleeping bag on the floor of my office in that in that double wide trailer. So it's not allowed to go home. And I really, you know, I, I couldn't, I knew that I was physically in a really bad, um, just in a state that I had to find a way to get out of there that would avoid any physical confrontation because I would, I would fail if it came mm. to that. Like if I jumped the fence and security swooped around. Oh, your kitty's behind you. That's right. <laughs> she's protesting. So she's Aww. doing a close on my chair. Oh, <laughs> I love yeah. kitties. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. She's she's lovely. Lucy the cat. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> she's a black and white kitty. She is. Yeah. Nice. I have a yeah. black and white Oreo. That's a boy. <laughs> mm. Yeah. She. I had her brother for a while who was... Uh, the friendliest creature I've ever met of, of any species. He was, uh, he was quite incredible, Bobby. Uh -huh. Um, but sadly he tried to be friendly with the car that was coming oh, the opposite direction. So I'm sorry. We lost him. Yep. And it, it amazed me. It really did amaze me how much I felt about that and still do. I mean, it was seven years ago now, but it was, you know, you get that attached to the personality of this animal this yes. uh it was quite quite uh quite something yeah um i miss him but yeah uh i've still got lucy and she's uh she's wonderful she was nice. also three times as intelligent as her brother you know, she had to teach him how to use a cat flap and 
you know, <laughs> what the litter tray was for and things like that. He was, oh. uh, but whatever. Anyway. Yes. Nice. Well, she's a beautiful kitty. She but yeah, is. so um, so I figured out, a, I, I so basically I came to the conclusion that I was going to have to get Mark to help me if I was mm. to succeed in escaping. Yep. And so that presented a whole other set of challenges. But long story short, at the end of the day, I got a message to Mark. Um, I, I made up this story that I had to go to the opti optician to get new contact lenses. I was mm -hmm. required to interrogate people on the e-meter as part of my duties. And so <clears throat> it was kind of plausible that, yes, of course, I have to have contacts. I can't not see. Um, and I, I very carefully planned it to, for, to do this on a day that mm -hmm. David Miscavige was in Clearwater, Florida, because I knew that if he was on the property, they were not going to let me go because I was, I had to be at every meeting that he had, mm -hmm. um, with management. So, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I planned it very carefully for Monday, uh, January 24th, 2005, I had an eye doctor appointment for 10, 15 AM the night before I had to do my completed staff work, which was essentially to say, Hey, I need to go into town to get, to go to the eye doctor. And I had to get this approved by five different people. I generally speaking, um, if you had an appointment in town, you would go with the medical officer with like maybe four other staff who also had appointments and she would kind yeah. of go around all of Hammett, drop you off, you do your appointment, and then she'd come back around to pick you up. So I was kind of banking on like an hour head start. Yeah. But when I came to getting this approved, I was told, no, you have to have a singular escort who's going to take you to the appointment and bring you back. And so I, and I couldn't put up, a, I couldn't fight that mm -hmm. because then they would go, oh, she's got something up her sleeve, you know? So I was like, okay. I, and um, so I got it approved to go with a singular escort, this woman named Christy Mullins, who had the anatomy and demeanor of like, uh, you know, I'd say a pit bull, but I don't want to offend pit bulls. Um, <clears throat> she was, you know, she was an aggressive, like twice the size of me, strong kind mm -hmm. of, um, yeah, person. So anyway, um, oh, and then also, um, I had, so it was kind of cold in January there, with, mm -hmm. even though it was the desert, you know, it was the only time of year that it was, a, mm -hmm. could get pretty chilly. So I had this down jacket and I had stuffed the few belongings that I had to take with me into the pockets of this jacket because I knew I was going to go to the appointment and take off um, or mm. at least try to. Um, and so that morning, that Monday morning, I got up at 6 a.m. and I went to some far corner of the property in a little room and um, made a call to a taxi company that I had, I had saved this number from like three weeks earlier. The last time I'd been home, there was a yellow book, uh, yellow pages there. Mm -hmm. So I'd kind of copied down this little number as like, just in case I have the opportunity to call a taxi, not really knowing what my plan was going to be. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, so I booked a cab from Walmart in Hemet to the Riverside bus station under the name Barbara Smith. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I said I needed the cab at 10 15. Mm. Okay, so now we cut to Christy and I are driving in the car. We pull into the Walmart parking lot. It's kind of raining or drizzling. Um, we pull in right at the dot of 10 15. And I look over, you know, Walmarts have the entrance exit, the two, two entrance exits. And I look over yeah. and there's the cab sitting at the other entrance. And so I just like spur of the moment, I, I was like, you know, in this big dilemma, like, am I just going to run for it? Am I just like going to, you know, what am I going to do? So spur of the moment, we pull into the parking lot. It's 10 15 on the dot. There's the cab. I'm like, Christy, just let me out here. Cause she couldn't find a parking spot right away. Mm -hmm. Just let me out up here. Cause it, it's my appointment time right now. I'll go on in while you park. And she mm -hmm. fell for it. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> so 
so I, I walked in, then quickly walked as fast as I could. And it was crazy. You know, I'm like, you'd think I would just mad dash run, but in my mind, it was playing out like a, a movie, you oh, know, yeah. or close to that in that I didn't want to run because I didn't want to call attention. And I, and I had this vision that she'd come in like, where'd she go? And they were like, oh, she ran that way, you know, like, so I walked as fast as I could, got in the cab and he, the driver turns and he's like, Barbara Smith. I'm like, yep, Riverside bus station, please. Um, and Mark had told me that he would call me on that phone right at the dot of 10 15 and that mm. once we had connected i was to shut it off and never use it again mm. so i had to but i had to wait for his call and so we're not even out of the walmart parking lot and christy radios me hey where are you i'm like literally i have like a three minute head start on these people mm. And um, I say, I'm in the bathroom. I'll be right there. And I'm thinking to myself, this driver must think I'm an absolute loony bin. I mean, seriously. <laughs> anyway, Mark called um, right right after that. And then uh, the crazy part, though, is that when I got to, so I got to the bus station, threw my uniform in the trash, got on the bus, made it to Barstow. And when I got to Barstow, I was supposed to call Mark from a payphone. Yeah to get instruct you know he was going to give me a, a ticket to get to kansas city it was a like a two-day greyhound bus ride oh. to kansas city um anyway i panicked when i got to barstow because i couldn't find a payphone that would accept coins they <laughs> all yep. only accepted calling cards and i was like mm. calling card what the hell's a calling card mm. <laughs> And again, I didn't want to ask anybody because I thought it would make me, it would leave this obvious trail mm -hmm. of breadcrumbs that they could follow me, which was silly when I, when I tell you what I'm about to tell you. Um, anyway, so I turned back on my phone and I called Mark and the first thing he said was, what are you doing? You're not supposed to be using that phone. I'm like, ah, and, uh, so he gave me the ticket number and of course I go to the counter and to give them the ticket number that he just gave me and they sell calling cards right there i'm like oh for crying out loud what yeah. the heck but because of that phone call they tracked mm -hmm. my my direction that i was heading and so i got on a bus to go to vegas it was a five-hour bus ride and we had a 45 minute layover in vegas and then i had to get on to a different bus mm -hmm. well when we got to vegas there were four people including greg Wilhair there waiting for me to take me back um and so that's you know the the scene in mark's book where i just i i thought i was done for i thought oh my mm. god i failed uh and i knew that like failure was not an option otherwise i literally <laughs> would never see mark again yeah um so i sat i went into the bus station put plopped my purse down on the floor sat down on it with the idea in my mind, well, at least if they try to physically drag me out of here, I can scream and hope that, you know, somebody might call 911. I don't know. It's, it's silly in retrospect. I Like, I could have just called 911. Why didn't that occur to me? Well, you know, because of 30 years of cult programming that oh. told me that that was the last thing I would ever do, um, yeah. you know, among other things. Oh. <laughs> anyway, needless to say, I made it on the bus and uh, they threatened to follow me on the bus they didn't though and i kind of knew i knew enough of their tactics the blow drill and all that that i knew that they would have to have special approval to do that and mm -hmm. that being that david miscavige was not even in the state um it was going to be hard for them to get that from him mm -hmm. he he would be the one to have to approve that yeah anyway so yeah all of the uh you know, it was against all odds, despite 30 years of programming, I should have failed at that moment, but thank goodness I didn't. And I mm -hmm. stuck to my guns and I just kind of figuratively plugged my ears to everything that they were saying to me and threatening me with. And, you know, <laughs> like Craig Wilhair was like, well, what if David Miscavige were here? I'm like thinking to myself, <laughs> well, he's not. So there's that. Thank mm. God. <laughs> And anyway, that wouldn't change my mind. I'm getting the heck out of here. Yeah. Anyway, taking back control of your life is such an exhilarating, scary, but um, 
awesome thing to do. It was for mm. me. It completely changed the course of my life irreversibly, of course. Mm. Yeah, for me too. Uh, the, I was nine years a public Scientologist. I, I did various auditor trainings, you know, Dianetics Method 1 through to Class 2. Um, and I was absolutely and thoroughly dedicated. Uh, I left because I was convinced by no less than Captain Bill Robertson that Ron Hubbard was no longer in the building. Uh, Cap mm. Captain Bill reckoned he was up on the mothership sending him uh, sector operations bulletins, which was, that's a whole other set of stories. Yeah. Um, but I you know, accepted that this this new attitude, being tough and ruthless, as David Miscavige had put it at the San Francisco Mission Holders Conference, which we were just then seeing the transcripts to, tough and ruthless. Tough, I didn't mind. Ruthless, without mercy? No, not not going with that. And I left with the intention, really, of perpetuating Scientology, of putting it in a safe place away from this, the mother cult, the crazy organization. And I just felt such an incredible relief. And that certainly carried on for about a year. But, and I was deluged with people. I, you know, accidentally found myself as the information source about Scientology in the UK. And I protected the various independent groups, even though within a few months I was kind of going, this is nonsense, actually. This doesn't make sense at all. This, yeah. you know, um, and it was interesting. It was interesting to know that, that, you know, you could become so devoted to something, so fervent about something, that, that you'd believe anything. And I'd gone into Scientology. There were, there were two things as a teen. I was 19 when I got involved. But two things as a teenager that, that I couldn't figure out. One was how could a serial killer, and I was particularly thinking of Jack the Ripper, do such awful things to another human being? I didn't understand that. It didn't make any sense to me. Yeah. And the other thing was, how could the German-speaking population of, of Europe have elected this, this dreadful man to be their leader and actually voted in 1938 to give up the right to vote? They'd had democracy for 20 years, nearly 20 years just after Versailles. And they decided they would give power to this man who very obviously was seriously ill yeah. uh, in many ways. And And... When I left Scientology, I had the answer to the second question provided to me, that, that I had given my loyalty to a group which was very much the opposite of what it said it was. Right. Um, it was actually enslaving people rather than liberating people. And rather than creating self-determinism and, and individuality, it was putting people under the control of one individual. So, you know, you'll be completely self-determined when you do exactly what Ron says. Right. And it's like, <laughs> no. Uh, and, yeah, of course, I, you know, I've now spent 40 years sort of going around this stuff and writing, I think, Blue Sky is still the only history of Scientology. Uh, Janet Reitman claimed that she'd written the first objective uh, history and I think the word objective was in there because when you go to a reference notes the first seven chapters it says largely based on uh, a piece of blue sky and barefaced messiah barefaced messiah was was based on a piece of blue sky um, Russell had the manuscript and I worked with him throughout the the research for that wonderful book yes but that's awesome I I mean I think we're probably going to have to come back and talk about this some more because yes I, very definitely I really want to understand your personal process of recovery. Yes. Let me say that, and I've said this frequently publicly, and I'm going to say it again, that, that Mark's Blown for Good is, I think, the first ex-member book to read. And there are, I think now, more than 100 ex-member books, yes. know, starting with Dr. Joe Winter in 1951, a doctor's report on Dianetics, bless him. Um, but it's, it's the one to read because it's so well written, it's it's written without bitterness. It's written with humor. And it's got two of the funniest stories I've ever read in my life you know, about uh, the kid called Power. Pure and, Power and, Coleman, yes. Yeah, <laughs> just, Epic. And what was the second name? one? What was the, the other one is one? is the, um, the, the announcement that the war is over. Uh, oh, yes. With the IRS and, and the fiasco of having to, because one of the cameramen had got 
had, had been eating an apple and his lens was clouded and the other one was looking at Shelley Miscavige's cleavage at the, <laughs> the moment when David made his great announcement to the relief of all concerned. And it would cost something, what, like something like $180,000 or something to dub in a little bit to make it look. Uh... So, yeah, uh, so I thoroughly recommend that. Awesome. But, I, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, it's um, hmm. yeah, no, very definitely. Let's let's um conclude here for today and plan on part two if you're game for that, because I would love to definitely. answer your questions and then also learn more about your work helping people get out over the last 40 years that you've been helping people with that, because it's always a, a something to, I think, delve into, like what does help people most in kind of separating out and getting out of that mindset. So I would mm. love to pause for today and resume at a later date if that works for you. Absolutely. And and just to, to put an emphasis on that, when Conway and Siegelman published the second edition of Snapping, which is a very interesting book, I, I don't um, thoroughly agree with their hypothesis about people snapping into a, a different personality. I've not really seen that. Um, though, it, as I say, it's an interesting hypothesis and it may well have happened to some people. There are conversion moments for some people. That doesn't seem to be so much the case with Scientologists. But I, I wrote a piece for Tony Ortega at the bunker, probably about 2013. And um, he passed it over to Conway and Siegelman because I'd said they only had three Scientologists in their, their test. And, and he he published the piece and corrected me as well, you know, so I got told <laughs> off in public, which I oh. definitely, definitely deserved oh, okay. <laughs> um, because my research was wrong. They, they'd actually talked to 33. And oh. There were two editions of the book. For the first edition in 78, 79, there were three. But in fact, Robert Vaughan Young was one of the people they later interviewed. Um, but he put me in touch with them. And I said, in your book, you say that um, Scientology, it, you know, where, where other groups like the Moonies and the Krishnas, you, three to six months, you'll be fine. With Scientology, you estimate that it takes 12 and a half years to recover unaided. And I put it to them that this was a guess and that it would be more accurate to say that the majority of Scientologists will never recover from what happened to them because it completely reconstructs how you view reality. Yes. Wow. And so, to you know, I, I've, I've worked, and it's not something that I'm really doing anymore. I'm, I'm actually writing a book about Charles Manson. but uh, And, you know, that's incredible. 54 years after those horrific murders in Los Angeles, hundreds of investigators, nobody has got into how deeply involved with Scientology Charles Manson and indeed Bruce Davis, who was another of the murderers, were. Bruce Davis came over to England twice to study Scientology during his time with Manson because wow. Manson told him to. And people wow. just put a paragraph saying, oh, he spent some time studying Scientology because they think it's a kind of faith that he abandoned along the way rather than an elaborate set of thought reform techniques. Wow, that's crazy. Oh, I'll but, look forward to that for sure. But yes, very definitely. We have lots more to talk about. Absolutely. And and I agree with you, by the way, too, on the recovery. You know, I've, um, I've been working with a therapist, which has been incredible. Mm. But it's made me realize that I don't, uh, having been born into Scientology and growing up in Scientology, I don't necessarily know my own pitfalls, mm. you know, that have been programmed in and so working through that and uncovering that and sorting that out is going to be something I'll be working on probably for the rest of my life. <laughs> but it, it, yes. And, and I think that, I mean, there is now a kind of a, almost a rift developing in, in, in various groups between born ins. I'm not going to call them second gens because often they're third, fourth, or even fifth gens, but yeah. born ins and recruits. And um, I talked to a, a chap who was born into the Moonies and he told told me last year and he told me how much he resented Steve Hassan because Steve Hassan was a recruit. Mm. And then he met, he'd met Steve and they'd talked and, and he'd realized this was a very strange way to think about things. That because you'd suffered more and I think with born-ins, you have suffered more. There are no two ways about that in, in most cases. But because you've suffered more, therefore, people who've not suffered as much should be the target of your ire, rather than the people who caused you the suffering. And, right. You know, 
which we we have to focus on. But if if you were born into it, then um, you don't have anything to compare it with. That's right. And most people, recruits, when they leave, tend to readopt the beliefs and behaviors they had when they got in, which is why when I left, so many of my friends started growing beards and smoking dope. Not not the women so much, the beards, but um, <laughs> that, that it was going back to adolescence. It was going back to, to something earlier. But but yeah, I've, I've worked with about 600 people in their recovery wow. over the last 40 years. And there is a lot to be said about it. And a lot of it is you can accelerate the process. You yes. really can accelerate the process. Yes. Um, but we'll talk about that. Yes, on we another will. Another occasion. Yes, I will very much look look forward to that. And um, just thank you again so much for your time, for your work, mm. and for everything that you do. And um, until next time, I appreciate you so greatly, John. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I appreciate the work you've been doing too. Thank you. Alrighty. Bye bye.